thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you, Jerry, and thank you, uh, Vancouver, for having us. This is one of the first uh, presentations we'll be given on this project down in Portland. It's uh, a project a lot of us have been working on for a very long time. It is very complicated, and it's very much under construction. So you'll be seeing some of those images uh, today of a project that's under construction, a presentation, and a story that's also kind of under construction. Um, get, get set up here. So first, uh, I want to describe a little bit about who we are. Um, and before kind of getting into the story of the digital environment that makes this project possible, it's important to acknowledge, I think, the human environment at, at, at ZGF and, uh, and with our many consultants that have, have made this project possible. Christian and I are just two of many, many people that have been engaged in this project and bringing their many talents uh, over many years to make it happen. Um, and also a little bit about ZGF. ZGF is a Pacific Northwest firm with its feet very much planted in the Pacific Northwest. It's um, started in Portland. It has grown to Seattle and Vancouver and then down the coast to Los Angeles and is, and is also national. And, uh, and it now includes even offices in, in the Rockies and Denver. Um, it is as involved in a variety of things, you know, many different kinds of building typologies. And the common thread, I think, is very much uh, a culture of craft that is rooted in the history, kind of in the Northwest. So that because I think we started here in the Northwest, we're able to kind of bring a, a, a different approach to project that, that is really focused on the crafting of, of structures and buildings. Um, and so I want to just give a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, again, this is a, a project for a new roof, an expanded terminal for the Portland International Airport. Um, I'm going to describe a little bit about the, the ask, you know, on the part of the Portland and what, what the challenge to the team was from, from the client. Uh, I'm going to describe the approach to how we, we kind of set up the problem with them. And then Christian's going to get into how digital technologies and wood allowed us to uh, kind of solve those problems. So the ask um, was first to, you know, yes, increase capacity. This is a, this, the Portland airport, like most airports, uh, is, is landlocked. Uh, it didn't have space to grow, so it had to grow in place, right? And that meant a lot of things. Um, had to grow in place and basically double it, find a way to double its footprint because it was very much a capacity problem. Right now, the, the airport receives about 18 to 20 million passengers a year, and by 2040, that'll go up to 35 million. So I had to find new ways to get more people through it, but in the context of an operating facility. Um, we were also asked to do all this in a way that newly engaged our region and kind of re reestablish or re kind of re reset up its, the, the facility's identity and tied it directly, more directly to the region. To do those things also with a new structure which would be seismically resilient to a Cascadia level event. And also to hit kind of very high, uh, very high bar in terms of energy performance and sustainability. So basically in doubling the footprint, we were also asked to reduce the energy consumption of the facility by more than 40%. That, that kind of, that very demanding level of ask required a lot of faith in the team. Um, and fortunately, we have been working with the Port of Portland for over 40 years and with our construction partners at, at Hoffman Construction and Skanska for those same 40 years on many different things. So the, the, there was a tremendously strong relationship across the team between the design team, the construction team, and on the client side. And that, that created a tremendous amount of trust and faith in that, that we could come up with a kind of radical solution for, for achieving these goals. Um, Significantly, I think it's also, there was a lot of other, the, that team brought to it, to the project, a, a very deep well of expertise, both on the kind of trade partner side, the supplier side, and on the design side. And for this presentation, I want to highlight especially uh, Swinnerton, a team of Swinnerton and CAD makers who helped us kind of think about how to build this roof. Um, Portland isn't known for its roof. Uh, it has the luxury slash burden of, of being known for what you step on when you arrive in Portland right now. This is kind of its cultural presence. You know, the, the airport's cultural presence is its carpet. And so part of our challenge was, was to kind of to ask 
ask of, of the project and the community if they could embrace a new kind of identity and an identity that is rooted in, in the material, uh, uh, an identity that's rooted in, in the communities that that material comes from, and especially an identity that's rooted in the, in the craft associated with that material. And so for all those reasons, you know, we, we focused on wood from the start. Um, and, and part of the charge was that, yes, it was from the region, but especially that because it's from the region, the port could achieve its, its equity and community resilience goals by, by kind of newly finding new ways to engage the suppliers of the wood, um, that, it could, that it could achieve its environmental stewardship goals, and then especially find new ways to kind of maximize the benefits of embodied carbon associated with wood. And to do that, um, I it's important, I think, to acknowledge that digital tools weren't just used in the construction and assembly of this, of this roof, but also on the front end to kind of really take a, a, a deep dive into the procurement and sourcing of the wood. Uh, we, we kind of worked on two tools, the first with Ecotrust down in Portland, which, which really looked to kind of very specifically measure the amount of embodied carbon in each wood component. And then secondly, this tool called Upstream, which, which we worked on with the University of Washington, which um, allows us to kind of really dig deep into where the, the force that these wood, the wood comes from. And by sourcing wood from, um, from sustainably managed forests, we were able to kind of massively increase the amount of uh, embodied carbon benefits of that wood. Uh, this, this is kind of the log deck problem. Log decks are not like, unlike these walls here, you know, just big mixes of wood coming from who knows where, and then they spit out wood components, right? So our challenge was to kind of unpack the log deck and really understand specifically where each piece of wood is coming from and to make, make those growers and suppliers accountable to them. Doing that allowed us to massively increase the, the carbon benefits of the wood. So, a conventionally sourced wood component might get six to 15 percent you know, carbon savings over other types of construction. We're able to kind of find benefits between 18 and 40 percent by, by um, really relying on the transparency of wood sourcing. So now I want to describe the approach. Um, this project is very much, because it's a remodel, about building in place, which also meant that we had to build off-site in a kind of important way. Building off-site meant that we had to embrace modularization, and, and going with modularization means we had to first define a very important kit of parts which could be flexible to that existing structure. And before we get into that, I just want to describe what the project is. This is the project in its complete form, uh, a new terminal in 2025, and to orient you, and the foreground is the kind of drop-off arrivals area. Uh, it'll be composed of four principal spaces, the first is the ticket hall, the first thing you enter, then security and processing, which is area two here, concessions nodes, which lead to concourses in area three, and an arrivals hall for people coming to Portland in area four. All of those will be joined in the future building by, by this new roof. Um, the existing building, like most airports, most pieces of infrastructure, is actually composed of kind of this crazy quilt of structures, right? This is, it's actually seven different structures stitched together over 50 years, each of those structures having its own kind of seismic criteria and even architectures. This project was about acknowledging that they had to stay, so they had to be upgraded to some extent, added to, and then scraped, the deck scraped, so that the systems below, all the important airport systems, remained in operation but then the new kind of passenger experience on the in-planning level was completely new in a, with a new kind of clarity and organization, and then all under a single roof of 400,000 square feet. Just for reference, the left-right dimension in this image is about 1,000 feet, and the, the north-south up-down is about 400. Building in place also meant building, of course, safely, right? This, the building had to remain operational and so it was important to come up with a way to build it which was maximally safe and reduce risk. This meant from the get-go that we couldn't go with a stick-built, standard stick-built approach. We couldn't be lifting with a crane pieces into place. It meant that we had to come up with a way to set up a structure that could be launched or pushed or actually wound up being pulled into place over the existing terminal. Uh, so that committed us to large-scale, long-span modular elements. 
this is uh, another illustration of that, of that problem, and it's a section through the terminal. On the right-hand side, you see the kind of arch entryway, the ticketing, the colorful stuff in this, di are in this diagram are th those things which needed to stay in operation during construction. You see ticketing, bag claim, you know, passengers have to get their bags. Those bags have to be processed to and from airplanes, bag operations areas. All that stuff had to be served by mechanical and electrical systems that had to stay in operation. So the approach to the structure was a very light, minimal touch. There's just 34 new columns, uh, replacing a, a building that had a portrait of 700 columns. Uh, we scraped the deck and removed structures which are non-essential, so retail spaces, offices, kept those which are essential, built a new roof on what had been the in-planing floor, and that became basically a construction site which is now being used to build the roof. Uh, there's three main column lines in the east-west, and only one of those column lines penetrates the existing building. The rest straddle it so that we could launch this roof into place. Uh, we built a lot of models to kind of try to understand or strategize how this might happen with a contractor and the port team. On the right hand side, this is one of those. On the right hand side, you could see that drop off area, the existing drop off area, which remains during construction. And this model is kind of an illustration, an early illustration of how, how can this roof be built up of a series of parts which can be stitched together in a very specific sequence. In the middle, all of those, those elements are built such that they're um, oriented in the east-west direction so that they could be pushed from west to east, east on the right-hand side of the screen. And on the two ends, they're, they're set up so 90 degrees to that so they can push from the airfield side towards the middle of the building. This meant we had to kind of think of a way to, to so fortunately for us, we had, you know, committing to modularization also means you need a lot of land. You need to build, build those modules somewhere. The airport had the land. Uh, and there's actually three construction sites here. The first is the terminal itself, the second is the fabrication yard, and the fourth is kind of the, the digital construction site, the virtual 4D construction site, which allows to study how to assemble this roof off site, to disassemble it, to pull it apart, to move it into place, and to reassemble it in the most optimized way. And that digital one is one Krishna will get to. Um, doing this, you know, obviously the main benefits here are safety, right? This could be built low, 12 feet off the ground in a safe way, not in the context of an existing operating airport, but also schedule compression. The building, the terminal itself could be demolished at the same time the roof could be built. How big? Um, those modules had to be a very specific size, right? Uh, and, and, and that size had to kind of work in such a way that the sequence of they could be stitched back together. And there's two, important dimensions in the, in the kind of any, any airport that we, that we use to determine the size of these long span elements. The first is, um, and they're both associated with airport processing. The first is ticketing, and the second is security processing. And what we learned is by benchmarking airports kind of around the world is that ticketing has a sweet spot dimension in one dimension in, in the kind of cross section of about 100 feet. And that's like you imagine um, circulation, queuing, a ticket agent, takeaway belts, you pair those things up, you get around 100 feet. In the other dimension, for security, the sweet spot is, is kind of a module based on 15 foot increments. And for us, it was important to establish a long span to maximize the flexibility of that space because ticketing with biometrics coming in and, and security processing is changing dramatically, right? So here we have long spans of 100 and 150 feet and that basically set up the whole grid that we laid across the airport for these 34 columns. Once the module is established, we had to think about, well, how are these things going to be sequenced so they can be put into place and not create any kind of risk in terms of sequence, right? Um, this, is, this is that same roof plan numbered, right, with each, each of the main things numbered in terms of its order of installation. Uh, you see number one there. You see number eight, four, five. They're different colors. The, the pink stuff, those are all of the super modules which are, are, are composed of girders, long span girders which sit on top of these columns. The green things are infill which slide between those, those same girders. The infill are kind of lighter elements that are yet to be installed, um, but they'll, they'll come and can kind of complete the picture. Right now, I think we're just finished with number six here, which Christian will share later, and we're working our way to the first infill, number eight. This is uh, going back to the fab yard. So this is, this is 
another a really important part of this was studying how, how can we design a module to be unzipped, right? So we had to design zippers, big mega zippers that allow these things to be stitched together because they're com built as complete as possible. You see on here roofing, right? That protects the wood, you know, for the two years that some of the stuff will be out in the fab yard. You see skylights with glazing installed. Underneath this roof, all the finishes are there, complete. All of the kind of acoustic treatments are there, complete. It's, the wood is finished. All the systems are installed. All the plumbing is installed. So all of those things that kind of cross between modules had to be designed as a series of zippers, so that such that could be built once, unzipped, moved into place, and then re-zipped together once it's over the terminal. And that meant kind of thinking of things as very much a kit of parts, right? That is, the, where the, dis, the assembly is really designed into how they're, how they're set up. And in, in most simple terms, there's kind of three things. There's the, the column itself, where the seismic base isolation occurs on the top of the column uh, for the Cascadia event. On top of that column are girders, long span steel girders that are 25 foot wide assemblies with all of the major utilities for the airport installed into them. And then between the girders are these wood infill cassette elements that are shaped and, and, it prov and provide architectural kind of form to the spaces below, but also help manage water and control daylight into that space. And those things are set up like this. On the, the left is kind of a, one of our early plans of like what is a cassette and how do, how do the main parts work and how do we make sure each of the main things is doing its best job, you know, the steel elements and the, the wood elements and then the mass plywood diaphragm. Um, and then how do we also set it up such that the wood elements could really be manipulated to help best define the spaces below. Um, on the right is an image of that same cassette but it being lifted into place, and this is basically last week, um, as it's starting to move from that fabrication yard to the airport. And the thing that's really striking or struck us as a team is that largely because of the approach to building, uh, that the, there was kind of this amazing level of, of sustaining the, the kind of idea of craft, both at the mega scale of the cassette and at the micro scale of the, the pieces, the kind of wood associated with that cassette. And that you know the part and the hole and the hole and the part kind of were simultaneously engaged, you know, because of the of the approach of digital fabrication in this thing. So now Christian's going to get into the log decks. Uh, good morning. Um, so you've just seen kind of the the modules, the unzipping. To be able to pre-assemble all of those things, we needed to componentize all the different parts of this of this roof. And so our pre our pre-construction phase and design was essentially a whole story of design for manufacturing assembly DFMA. Um, and in trying to figure out how to make those components, we had to determine best use of material, what are the properties, what are the tolerances, and I can't emphasize tolerances enough just because as architects, we tend to drive towards that zero tolerance, but that won't work, especially when you have to go through multiple cycles of assembly and disassembly. So understanding that there are design tolerances that have to be aligned and agreed upon, manufacturing tolerances for different wood products, but then also those assembly ones. So you're going to see video of Duren Krudwald and Mammut taking things apart, sliding, ejecting cassettes. Those require very tight tolerances. So for instance, Early on, one of the tolerances that, <clears throat> that we agreed to was the distance from center line of girder to end of glue line was only two and five eighths inches both sides. So as they're sliding this 800,000 pound wood drawer in between these steel girders, they don't have a lot of room because they have to build it, connect it, disconnect it, move it, put it back together again. So wood technology <clears throat> today is primarily based on 19th, mid 20th century, right? We're just gluing different forms of wood fiber together. So we didn't see this necessarily as a, a radical reinvention of wood, but um, it was important to expand wood's potential. So in this case, how far can you do that arch glue lamp? One of the early concepts um, I think Nat touched on it a little bit before, was kind of breaking down the overall terminal into different rooms. 
but the kind of the ethos or the reflection of the Pacific Northwest that we wanted to embody was this idea of a walk through the woods. And so using commodity from the forest, but also trying to create this delight that goes with it became this process of trying to combine timber with technology so that we could produce the, uh, you know, glue lamps, mass ply panels, or tooling for the, for the lattice. A big shout out to CAD makers. They put in over 10,000 hours of detailing into this project. This helped kind of identify and hone in on those tight tolerances like the two and five eighths from the girder layout of the MPP. You'll probably see this video at their stand as well, or a version of it. Please notice the curved lattice around those openings there. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Before we arrived at glue lamps as being our preferred structural wood infill system, we did a lot of different studies on wood roofs. One, because it reflects the region, but two, um, we wanted to find the lightest, most economical way to do that. So diagrids, uh, different shell structures were things that were explored, but those weren't as efficient as glue lamp. <clears throat> and using parametric tools, um, you know, we had to, we had to basically, um, sorry, I flipped these slides around. Um, the exploration was whether it's flat or arch beams. Flat seemed the simple approach. Somebody, some of the contractors wanted to do kind of a Costco roof, but we knew that an arch roof was going to be more efficient because the cross section, the structure is better, plus you can manage water and reduce snow loads. Plus, because we're kind of dividing the overall space into these different rooms, the volumes of the ellipsoid vaults and domes are the thing that define the space. So parametrically controlling these things, we arrived at kind of the ideal shapes and form for the roof, but we had 31 profiles. And our trade partners with Swinerton and different manufacturers that they were working with were like, that's too many, that's not efficient. So, to sharpen the pencil, make the design more efficient for manufacturing, we whittled that down to simply seven profiles that you see there. We kind of start at the flat and then gradually work our way up the arch. So the tallest flat beam that we have is nine feet three inches. Um, Zippo laminators done in Eugene fabricated those. They had to get a special APA inspection just to have those done. And then the tallest arch rises about 15 and a half feet. Here you see some of those beams that Zippo fabricated, and I can't speak their praises enough because early on in design, we thought we were gonna have to fabricate these beams maybe in three pieces, ideally two, but we always had a splice that we had to contend with, which would cost more money, and architecturally that's not what we were looking for. Um, John Redfield, who's the operation manager for Zippo, approached Swinerton and said, you know, we've never done a beam like this before, but we understand, you know, we have decades of experience, we know how to do it, so give us a chance. And they ended up producing two mock-up beams, and they wanted to press two at a time because to make it efficient for their process, their cost, and their labor, they wanted to stack and do more than once, more than one at a time. So you can see an example of, in the inset there, where they're pressing that. And notice they're not using the, um, you know, there are newer technologies for automating the pressing process. But in this case, it wasn't needed. In fact, um, talking to Casey Holstrom, one of the, who runs the company, that level of investment they don't find beneficial because the old ways still work really well. So they built the two mock-up beams. They tripped one up. We did a 3D scan of it, and the beam was ostensibly perfect. It had camber, deflection, everything came out as expected. There was one part of the beam that was maybe an eighth of an inch out of tolerance, but it didn't matter. And so 
that was kind of the birth of the expression of perfect is good enough. And that, I have to say that you'll see how far construction has come along now. But that phrase has been reused over and over again for many different reasons. And given the risks and complexity in this, it's kind of, it's remarkable. So I guess appreciate how simple it's become. Yeah. Here's kind of the fabrication process for one of the 80 foot beams. First, they pressed a four foot continuous beam. Second day, they did some additive sections cut to within half inch of a profile, planed it perfectly to the profile. They used steel templates to, for repetition. And then as needed, Swinnerton would come in and reinforce those beams. So you had Swinnerton working in Zippo's facility as they're pressing, doing the reinforcing. In the upper left, you can see one of the coders applying the stain. So as beams were finished, um, they were wrapped, delivered to site without anything else. The coating, adding the coating to was something that Swinnerton now recommends every project to just because it makes it easier for weather protection and if you have to clean it, it's easier to clean it. Mass ply panel, or as when we started the project, it was mass plywood panel, but Ferris has kind of changed their branding of it. Um, so we have this issue of arch glue lamps, but mass ply being a flat billet material. Um, so how do we form that? How do we create those curves? And so that was something that we worked with our structural engineers to understand how far we could twist and warp the material. And the, the dimension that they gave us was seven inches out of plane. So that became our constraint. So as we used parametric controls to set the top or bottom curves of the beam, that's what we would use. I should note also that you see the picture on the upper right there. Whenever mass plywood arrived on site, it had already been pre-cut or pre-routed at Ferris's facility. So all of that, all of the detailing that CAD makers was involved with, with Swinnerton was also used to produce the tooling for those machines. <clears throat> So to understand the best efficient use of that material, we used parametric tools again to basically drape that flat material over the glue lambs, understand how it could be panelized, you know, what the maximum size, I think Ferris still today produces up to 40 by 12 foot um, billets at different thicknesses. Um, and so we needed to kind of proof that out from the design sense and then in these examples here, you see our working model. I should note that as part of the ZGF culture of craft, we have workshops, model shops in every office. In Portland, we also have what we call ZFAB, which is basically our own fabrication shop that's off-site. They were integral through every part of this because as we first built the design model digitally, before it was detailed digitally by the contractors, we would also fab models or full-size mock-ups as well. But in the center, you can see Swinnerton's full-size mock-up of a quarter part of the dome. Um, what that did for them was optimize, well, first proof out that they could panelize it the way that they wanted to. They could cut it at the factory and install it as intended. And I should say that one of the unique things about um, the mass ply product. Typically you see it used today, I guess, in, as, as columns and beams, but I feel like it gave us an opportunity to improve the design. Um, just because of areas where it gets expressed, it just looks very clean. They've also improved the finish. Um, Tyler Ferris just the other day sent me some images of um, an, increase, uh, a, an improved appearance grain that they've now produced, and it's stunning. Um, I think eventually it will kind of compete um, more with the look of CLT, but be a veneer product. Um, but where the real benefits were for cost and labor was on the install side. So on the right side, you see them installing those pre-cut panels um, on the roof. 
and the kind of two celebratory things to call out here was that after going through the DFMA process, we didn't call it that at the time, but that's basically what we were doing. Um, you end up with really tight tolerances, tight alignment, and tight joints. So on the left side, you've got panels that were cut off site, no more than an eighth of an inch between them. The routed circular opening was also done off site, and there's just perfect alignment between those panels. Um, the superintendent who you saw looking up at the cassette earlier, he didn't believe that Swinerton would be able to install it this way for a very long time. It wasn't until we got to the first infill um, when they did this that he was like, oh yeah, you were right. Um, on the right side, we also use mass plywood for the curbs around the skylights. In this case, it's six inches. But what's challenging about this is you're typically cutting ply with a square cut, right? But we've got this soccer ball shape, and so you have to, how do you set that down there and anchor it to it? So Swinerton, who um, this project kind of helped give birth to Timber Lab, Timber Lab would use the, um, their CNCs to tool this compound curve cut at the bottom of the, of the material so that when it sat on top of this curve, or on top of the roof deck, you can see in the upper right there that there's just this perfect quarter inch joint uh, to hold it there. And I should add that 3D scanning, you know, first Zippo used it um, to validate that. Um, I don't think I finished that story actually. Those mock-up beams, which were slated to be firewood, because they were so good, only a part of it out of tolerance, both of those are actually in the project. So um, if you come down and visit when it opens, we'll point them out to you. You can't tell the difference between them or the other ones. That's how good they are. Um, keep going. So lattice, or the three by six. I noticed out in the hallway here, there's kind of a similar dimension wood element. These are beautiful and straight. They're also glue lambs. Ours are just three by six lumber. Um, and this is really kind of the defining element that creates the domes and vaults for those different rooms. And the tension, what I find really beautiful about this is the tension of that ellipse with the kind of projecting lattice against the flat. Very subtle, but very beautiful. And, and Lai was talking before about kind of the, also the tension between traditional contractual requirements for how we deliver, right, uh, deliver projects. One of the slides we took out of this deck was a stack of drawings, 2D printed drawings, which we printed but nobody ever really looked at because everyone just looks at digital, right? And then on the other side, you have these BIM models, coordination models with different software. Um, but contracts don't allow us to do those 3D deliverables or it's very difficult to. And so, because there's risk and liability. So early on, we got asked the question a lot, how did you detail all of this lattice? Because there's 36,000 sticks. That's got to be a lot of drawings. And the answer is we didn't architecturally do that. So the three drawings that you see here was the simplest way that we could define the architectural forms and the extents that they follow. So similar to the, the glue lambs, the, um, which have these different ellipse shaped to them at the bottom, the lattice also followed a few different ellipses. The constraint of the flat, the slope lattice, which is coming down the vaults, and then in section, there's a very subtle one. And it's really the intersection of all of those that creates the two different, or the, the holistic form that you see there. Now, somebody had to detail that. Thank you, cab makers um, and Swinerton, because we did use parametric tools, scripting, you know, Rhino, Grasshopper, Python, um, to do all of that, to optimize the design. Within that 36,000, about 12,000 of them are slope lattice. Slope lattice, um, you can see the kind of bird's mouth notch on the lower left there. Those were the only ones that had to be CNC'd so that they could be seated and anchored to the glue lambs. 
there were 1,250 types of cuts that had to be programmed and to make those, <clears throat> to make that happen. You can see Timber Lab CNC on the right there with an example of some of those lattice pieces uh, that were notched. The other step that they took, which has some more potential, is they, they printed a code. They had sort of a hand inkjet printer that they could just roll a code on every piece of lattice. So if something was damaged, they need to replace it, or even in the future, if the port needs to do <clears throat> some maintenance, they can get the stick, see the code, and then that information is there and it can be recut. There's also potential, though, on the sustainability side. If you want to, you know, so 40 percent, I think I have this fact right, 40 percent of the wood in this project we can trace back to the force of origin. So there's a lot of metadata there. <clears throat> but by adding that metadata to the element itself, that's just more transparency that can be tracked back to the actual piece. Some of our partners, um, for instance, there's um, indigenous groups that we partnered with on the sourcing of this. So when we get to these oval skylights, and you have the infill beams in between, we can point at these and we can say, yes, those came from the Coquel Nation in Oregon <clears throat> or wood from Hyla Woods. Um, a lot of, I think at least 60% of the lattice, maybe more, was actually milled from Castor's Custom Cuts. It's just a small family that has a milling operation, um, but they did an enormous amount and it's beautiful. Um, I wanted to show this because the, um, I've talked about a lot of things being cut, tooled, off-site, and all of that required digitization of the model, the components, going through shop drawings to get there. But sometimes you need a saw on site to be able to finish the job. And in this case, Swinerton ran the lattice around the oval openings a little bit long, surveyed again, you know, did laser scans, and at the top, um, the curb at the top is kind of interesting because when we detailed it architecturally, we had this vertical lattice that comes down. You can see the detail on the lower right shows how vertical, flat, and curved lattice. So that was that element in the video where you see the, the, curve, the wood curved down um, at certain parts of the roof. And at those locations, you needed to have very tight tolerances. And so that's why they didn't cut it until it got to the field. But they surveyed, oh, we detailed it architecturally as a shim at the top of the curb, something for them to kind of adjust. They were, Swinerton, CAD makers, Timber Lab were confident enough in what they did that they decided we're going to make it a CNC element and route it in so that when we get out into the field, the carpenters don't have to mess around with shims and it's just gonna be perfect. And in this case, perfect was good enough. Yeah. Um, and I will just conclude with this video to kind of show you where progress is today. Um, once the, the lattice was installed underneath, they would begin moving. So this is the ejection of mod eight that you saw in that, from that earlier diagram. This had to slide out first, partially because they were testing it, and then next because the first module needed to be lifted. So that's what the lifting looks like. All of the 34 col or not all of them, most of them were placed prior to this. So the stage was kind of, you know, deck was scraped, columns were placed. Then here you have the self-propelled modular transporter or SPMT driving over from the prefab yard to the terminal. It takes, it's about half a mile and they would do it at a slow stroll. So it was about 45 minutes. And in this case, they had to kind of come in, work around a column, could crab walk sideways. And then you'll see lots of little lifts, Mammut, Dern Grunwald working. What they're doing here is the strand jacks, which is a, the back 
of it are pulling it. it. The cables are anchored to the columns and it's pulling it into place. And they grease the underside of the girders, which sit on top of those red jacks and the red jacks have very thick Teflon pads on them. So this unit might weigh 800,000 pounds, but they don't really have to exert you know, more than 80,000 pounds of force to be able to pull it into place. We used shoring towers to kind of help get that over to, um, to the final, final column. Here you see module six coming over. You're gonna see it kind of point up and rise, and then it'll kind of settle back down again. And they do this, they tip it up a little bit because they need, as it's cantilevered out, they want it to kind of get out over the next support before it comes down again. This was kind of a special moment to be able to go out there for us, been working on it for years, because now we're seeing the scale of the structure relative to the, to the human, to the occupant, and the daylight coming through. So here's our kind of walk in the forest experience that is kind of coming to life. Thank you.